think it's probably fair to say that the world has got a few problems. In fact, I think most people would probably agree that that is something of an understatement. And we only have to look at the news around us on the television, the internet, the newspapers or whatever, and we see all kinds of problems and issues, a lot of them pretty serious. If we were to just consider some of the issues that we face in the world today, we have the continued issues of wars that are going on around the world as we speak at this moment. There are over 50 which are currently going on in the world at the moment, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, Iraq, Somalia. There's a big drug war going on in Mexico and in many other places around the world. And thousands of people are killed every year and we see these scenes of devastation that are left behind by these wars. Those are wars that are actually going on. We also have the potential for war. I'm sure you've seen many headlines similar to this over the last few days and weeks with regards to North Korea and the situation there, the increasingly hostile rhetoric that is coming from the government there. Nobody knows if he has actually got nuclear weapons, but he's certainly making the promise that he wants to use them if he gets them. And it's a great concern for a lot of people. And we have headlines again like this. The US Air Force is preparing to put nuclear armed bombers back on 24 hour ready to fly alert. Something which hasn't happened since the end of the Cold War some 26 years ago. We have also the problems associated with immigration, often as a result of the wars that are going on around the world. And we see the heartbreaking scenes, don't we, of people who are trying to escape and flee from war, from oppressive regimes, from violence, and they grab whatever belongings they can carry, and with their families, they try and make their way to different countries. And we see the problems that arise, can arise when they get there. People sometimes say, we have enough problems of our own, we don't need any more, and the difficulties that that can result in. Brexit. What on earth's going on there? Nobody seems to know, not even the government seems to know quite what's going to happen. And what, what is the effect going to be politically, socially, economically? Nobody, see, nobody seems to know quite what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. And again, it's a big area of concern for a lot of people. We have the very real threat of another financial crisis. Um, there was a statement made by an economist earlier this year a man called James Davidson, who correctly predicted the financial collapses in both 1999 and 2007. He recently said that key economic indicators don't imply that a 50% collapse is looming. It is already on our doorstep. So again, this is something that a lot of people are worried about. Their future, the future of their children, and what is going to happen. We have situations such as this. I'm sure you'll all recognise that headline or ones very similar to it from just a few months ago. The bombing of the Manchester Arena when so many people were killed and injured. And terrorism was something that until relatively recently tended to be something which happened somewhere else. It was in another country. No less terrible, but it was always a little bit removed from us here in the country that we live in. And suddenly now we see these things happening on our doorsteps and very close at home to us. And again, it is an area of great concern. Um, these headlines from just recently, UK terror threat is at the highest since the 1970s IRA plots. And from just a few days ago, the boss of MI5 warns of the intense terror threat that we are facing in our country today. We have a situation with crime levels in this country. You may have noticed just recently, last week, the government released the latest statistics on crime for the last year. And it didn't make for particularly uh, happy reading. Uh, this was the headline from the BBC just a few days ago. Crime rises by 13% in England and Wales in just one year. And then we have the breakdown in analysis of those crimes. And we get headlines like this that violent crime is up 19%, sexual offence is up 19%, knife crime is up 26%, uh, and so on. And we see these kind of rises in crime in society around us, and again, it's a great cause for concern to a lot of people. 
especially when you look at the rates in which those are increasing. This is just violent crime in England and Wales over the last few years, and we can see a, a noticeable increase. Uh, now, there are those people who would say, well, they've changed the way in which they record the crimes, and maybe that's true, but it doesn't alter the fact that the crimes are still being committed in the society in which we live, and it gives a great amount of concern and worry to an awful lot of people. I'm sure we could probably name many, many more issues that worry us about where the world is heading, about what is going on. And we have issues with, with all sorts of things, don't we? With drugs, with, with gang violence, debt, poverty, the state of the environment, pollution, health, and, and so on and so forth. And I think it's true to say that for a lot of people, the outlook for the world, for society, is worrying. Even those who think maybe they're insulated from the worst of the problems, well, there are global issues which are now affecting a lot of people. And it can lead to a lot of questions. Where is the world heading? What is going on with society? And can we generally, gen genuinely hope for a better world? Uh, and when we say better there, I mean in the sort of medical sense, whereas by if you get better from a disease, it's cured, it's gone completely. So when we say a better world, we mean a world where all these myriad problems are resolved for good. Well, as we've tried to resolve any problem, in order to do so, you have to try and work out, well, what's the root cause of the problem? If you don't address the root cause of the problem, then the problem's not going to go away. It's going to be a bit of a challenge trying to solve it. Now, we don't have time to look at all the world's issues in, in, in great detail. So just to consider just, just three things which uh, are a problem in society that we live that are a great cause for concern to a lot of people. Um, so firstly then, this issue of violence. As you've just seen from the newspaper headline, the violent crime is, is on the increase, and, and quite rapidly so, it seems. What causes violence? Well, I think if we were going to look at some of the main causes, I think we could probably say that anger is a very large cause for violent incidents that occur. People get angry, they can't control it, or they don't want to control it, the anger builds, and it can result in lashing out, physically lashing out, to those around them, and as we know, the consequences can be so devastating. I think probably these two play quite a large part in that as well. The pride, the arrogance, people want to make themselves out to be better than those around them, or they want to try and dominate those around them, and they do so by physical means. They try and force control, or what they call respect, and sadly, violence is the way they quite often choose to do that. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I would never claim to be. Um, that is not an exhaustive analysis of violence and all, and all its causes. I'm sure there's all sorts of factors, but I think most would agree that those are some key factors in violent incidents which occur. Uh, what, what about another one then? Well, what about theft? Okay, again, it's a big problem. I'm sure you all locked your houses before you came out this afternoon because there is a very real worry that someone might break in or try to break in and steal things. What causes someone to steal? I think probably two main causes, no big surprises. Greed would be a large one, wouldn't it? Uh, what they have is not enough. They want more, so they go and take what isn't theirs. And secondly, well, people get envious, don't they? They see something that someone else has, they want it, so they go and take it. Two large causes of, of theft. Uh, and another one then, uh, antisocial behaviour. Now this is a relatively, uh, well it's, it's a word which has cropped up a, a lot more in recent years than, than it ever seemed to be before. Uh, antisocial behaviour order is something which, which we, we are sadly all too familiar with these days, aren't we? And what do we mean when, when people behave antisocially? Well it's when, when they are behaving in a way which is inconsiderate or offensive or distressing or upsetting to those around them in society. What makes people behave that way? Well, I think there's a large amount of selfishness. They think about what they want. That's their primary cause for concern. Sadly, sometimes, there's a certain amount of spite. Things are done deliberately to cause upset, to cause offence, and to cause distress. And I think, probably again, these two come into play. Pride and arrogance. People look down on others. They think that what I want is more important than what you want. 
and therefore I'm going to do what I want to do without any regard for the effect that might have on anybody else. Now that's a very quick consideration of just a very small number of problems in society today. It's not exhaustive, there's all sorts of, of factors and issues involved in that. But, but as we can see, a large amount of those problems comes down to arrogance and pride and selfishness and greed and envy and anger. And given those underlying causes are all human character traits, it's kind of obvious, really, what the problem is. The problem is people. People are the problem, aren't they? The, the way they act, the way they think, how their mind works. In other words, human nature is the problem. And if we were to look at a lot of those issues that we just touched on at the start, if you trace it back, and probably you wouldn't have to trace it back that far, you'll find that the problems are caused by the way people behave, the way they think, the things they say, and the things that they do. Well, if that's a problem, what is the solution? And if so many problems are caused by human nature itself, how are we going to overcome that? And as the population of the world grows, as it does by around 75 million people every year, surely that means the problem is only going to get worse. Well, we think, well, maybe our world leaders can help. That's what they're there for, isn't it? To be a source of guidance, to, to steer the nation, to steer humanity in the right direction. Well... What about that then? Not a day goes by without this chap being on the news, does it? Donald Trump. Is he going to help address the root cause of the world's problems? Is he going to steer his nation, the humanity, in the right direction? Well, here's a couple from him. <clears throat> My whole life I've been greedy, greedy, greedy. I've grabbed all the money I could get. I'm so greedy. There's not much I can add to that, is there? There's another one of his. I want to brag. I love to brag, all right. So there we go. This is a man who now leads one of the largest, most powerful nations on the planet, openly displaying the very characteristics that we can see cause so many problems in the world around us. Well, what about this chap then? I'm sure you will recognise him as well. Vladimir Putin, again, in charge of one of the largest, most powerful nations on the planet. Well, former US presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, who had a number of dealings with him, said he is a very arrogant person to deal with. Another man called John Seifer, he worked for the CIA for many years, he was a station chief in Moscow, described him simply as a playground bully in how he dealt with people and situations. Recently he expressed views of ambivalence towards Joseph Stalin one of the world's most infamous dictators, responsible for the deaths of many millions of people. He was just a, a, a man with good intentions, according to Vladimir Putin. And also, we've seen in recent years, his dealings with Crimea. He saw something he wanted, he went in, and he took it. And again, we see the very characteristics being displayed that are the root cause of so many problems. Now, this is not in any way a political talk. We don't align ourselves politically with any party, but that's just two very influential world leaders showing the very characteristics that we've just identified cause so many of the problems in the world today. Now, you may say, well, that's, that's, that's not fair. That's only two leaders, and there are many countries in the world, and there's a lot of, a lot of leaders who, who are not like that, who have different ideals and, and so on and so forth. And yes, maybe that is true. But are they solving the problems that we see in the world around us? Are any of them coming up with absolute solutions to all these issues, to all these problems? And we have to say no. We can look and see the evidence in the world and the news around us. It's certainly not the case. Well, is that it then? Is hoping for a better world a bit of a pipe dream? Is it kind of a hopeless aspiration to have? Well, no, absolutely not. Our reason for looking at this subject is specifically to give hope, to show that what the Bible offers is a real and a genuine hope for a better world. Well, first of all, about that 
root cause of the problem, as we said earlier. If you don't address the root cause of the problem, the problem's never going to go away, is it? Does the Bible recognise that there is a problem with human nature? Does it acknowledge that? Well, yes, absolutely it does. The Bible is very clear about human nature. The heart, the mind, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's very succinct, but it basically confirms what we've been considering, doesn't it? Uh, that the human heart, the human mind, is to susceptible to all those issues, to the, to the anger, the greed, the pride, and, and so on and so forth. All those characteristics which cause so many problems in the world today. Jesus himself makes a very clear statement on exactly this point. Would you turn, please, to the Gospel of Mark and chapter 7. <clears throat> Gospel of Mark chapter 7 and Jesus here talking to his disciples and he explains exactly what we've been considering. Mark 7 and verse 20. And Jesus said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye or envy, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now that list of issues there covers a large proportion of the issues in the world today. Uh, the, the anger, the murder, the, the envy, the deceit and so on and so forth. But, but note the first thing on the list there it says, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts. And that's where everything starts, isn't it? In the heart, in the mind. That thought process, that is where our words, our actions, they all begin with that thought process in the human mind. Now you might say, well, some people live in a bad environment. They're brought up in, in a very difficult, challenging environment. Uh, they get led astray by, by their friends, their acquaintances, and, and you know that's what causes them to go off the rails. Well, that's, that's very true. Sadly, some people are born into very difficult and challenging circumstances which undoubtedly have an, an effect on them. But whatever situation we're born into or what we find ourselves in, it doesn't alter the fundamental truth that we've just looked at about the human heart, the human mind, that it is flawed. Just turn, please, to that reading we took together from Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> and it tells us here of the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Um, and they're born into uh, a perfect world. It's unpolluted, it, it, it's, it's unspoiled, and they're living in this environment. And Abel, he looks after sheep, and Cain, he, he grows crops. Uh, and they both bring an offering of what they've produced to God. Uh, sheep for Abel, he brings, and then the, the fruit of the ground, as it says, for, for Cain there in verse 3. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. So this is them bringing their offerings to God. And God was pleased with Abel's offering, but he wasn't pleased with Cain's. We're reading on in verse 4, the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And when Cain hears that God's not pleased with his offering what happens carrying on in verse 5 Cain was very angry and his countenance fell he gets angry there it is that base human emotion that causes so many problems anger his pride had been hurt he was jealous of his brother and his response was to get angry and notice how God deals with him verse 6 so the Lord said to Cain why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. Why are you getting angry, says God? If you do the right thing, you'll be accepted, just like your brother Abel was. But he gives him that clear choice, doesn't he? You can do the right thing and be accepted, or sin lies at the door. He gives him that choice. You can either do what's right, or not and he's not pressured into either choice 
He's just given the choice. And Cain makes his choice, doesn't he? Verse 8. Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. He kills his brother. That's the result of his anger. He kills his own brother. He listens to himself, to his own anger, rather than to God. Now, he wasn't pressured into making that decision. There was no uh, peer pressure. There were no peers there to pressure him. There was no, no gangs to, to, to kind of control how he, how he acted and how he thought. There was no influence from TV and media and, and so on and so forth. That was his own choice out of his own heart. And what was it we saw in Mark chapter 7? For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. And this act that he committed was straight out of his own heart. It's a blatant example there for us of human nature. This is emphasised again in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Please turn to Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus himself emphasises this problem. That bad thoughts lead to bad actions. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. You have heard that it was said of those to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So whereas being angry isn't actually itself committing murder, well, that's where the murder starts, with again the thought process, the anger, the evil thoughts. That's where the problem starts. So yes, the Bible clearly identifies the root cause of the problem. It gives us examples of it and gives us warnings about it. Um, turn please now to Galatians and chapter 5. <clears throat> and again, we get some very clear warnings about human nature and about what it can result in. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evidence, and by the works of the flesh it means the, the, um, the, out the outcome of human nature. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And left to its own devices, unchecked, this is what the human heart comes up with. These kind of things. And again, how many of those issues that we've just considered have these as their origin? Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, envy, murder. Again, all the root causes of so many problems in the world today. But now, if we carry on in verse 22, we have the contrast but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. By fruit of the Spirit, it means the result of following God. And the antidote's there to all those issues. And notice the last one on the list there, self-control. In other words, not reacting how we might instinctively want to react the outbursts of anger, the envy, and so on and so forth. So we can go the way of human nature with all its problems, which the Bible categorizes as sin, or we can go the way of God. And what are the consequences of following these two ways? Well, the very next chapter tells us, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Uh, I'm just going to put this up in a, a slightly more modern translation here. <clears throat> Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So if we follow the, the way of the flesh, uh, as we've just read in, in the, uh, the previous chapter, if we follow our natural human desires, only looking to please ourselves, there's only one outcome. It will be destruction. It will be our death and if we go against God's ways that's all we can hope for 
There will be nothing more than that. And whenever we die, and we don't know when that will be, that will be the end. There will be nothing more for us. By contrast, if we follow the ways of God, the fruits of the Spirit, as it was described again in the previous chapter, well, God is offering to us eternal life, living forever. And that really is what God is offering, eternal life. Now, those who try to control their human nature, their natural desires, who follow God, who try to do what he asks, they will receive eternal life in the kingdom of God. And that's confirmed again for us in a very well-known verse in Romans chapter 6. For the wages of sin is death, that's the outworking of human nature, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what God is offering to every single person. It's a simple choice. We follow our own way, which leads to death, or we can follow God's way, which leads to eternal life in the kingdom of God. Well, what will that kingdom be like? Well, we're given a little sneak preview, if you like, in Revelation. It says this in chapter 21. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In other words, all that is wrong with the world at the moment will be put right. All the terrible things that we see in the world so often, some of which we've thought about, there's a lot of other ones we haven't even considered, but all those things will be done away with forever. All the violence, all the pain, all the hurt, and everything that goes with it. Well, who's going to lead this kingdom then? Someone like Donald Trump? Someone like Vladimir Putin? someone who maybe means well but is ultimately ineffective in dealing with these problems well no it will be the Lord Jesus Christ a man in whom there is no guile no deceit who is truthful who is kind who is caring but who has the power of God at his disposal we read in Isaiah chapter 9 speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So the Lord Jesus Christ will be ruling in a kingdom of justness, of righteousness, and a kingdom of peace and it will last forever and those that have followed God who have tried to do what he's asked will themselves be changed will you turn to Corinthians please first book of Corinthians and chapter 15 and this nature that we have that we've identified as being such a problem that we have to try and control that very nature itself will be changed and it will no longer be an issue. First, First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And we will no longer be sinful mortals struggling to control that nature, that wayward nature, with all its anger, its envy, its greed, and so on and so forth. And yes, sometimes it's hard. It's not easy trying to go against our natural human nature, trying to do what God wants. But verse 58, if we carry on there. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. So yes, it might be hard, it might be challenging, but it won't be in vain. It will be worth it. It will be worth more than we can ever possibly imagine. Can we hope for a better world? Absolutely, 100% yes, guaranteed. A better world is coming. The Bible acknowledges the problem with human nature, but it tells us what can be done about it. 
if we can troll it as best we can now by trying to follow God's ways, that when the Lord Jesus returns, we will be changed and it will no longer be a problem to us. And we can be part of God's kingdom here on earth when everything that is wrong will be put right. But whether we're a part of that or not is entirely dependent on us. God has offered us salvation, he's offered us eternal life in his kingdom, but he's not going to force us to accept it. It's up to us to reach out and accept what God is offering. But if we do nothing, then when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to establish that kingdom, we'll, we'll miss out. We won't be able to accept what God has offered. Uh, Mark chapter 16 tells us, He who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And again, we have that simple choice put before us. Now, we don't know when Jesus will return, to set up the kingdom we don't know exactly when that will be but we are given clues turn to the second book of timothy please and chapter three two timothy chapter three uh, and verse one but know this that in the last days perilous times will come and when it says last days there it's talking about the time immediately before the lord jesus does return to set up that kingdom of god in the last days perilous times will come men will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy unloving unforgiving slanderers without self-control brutal despisers of good traitors headstrong haughty lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God and we see again don't we all those characteristics that cause so many problems in the world today the arrogance the greed the violence and so on and it's telling us that we're living in the last days right now Jesus also said in Luke chapter 17 as it was in the days of Noah so will it be also in the days of the son of man so right before Jesus returns what he says is it's going to be like how it was in the days of Noah what was it like in the days of Noah the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence so just as the earth was full of violence in the time of Noah that's how it will be right before Jesus returns and what was that statistic we looked at at the start the headline violence is up in the UK by 19% in the last year alone it's happening right in front of our eyes all around us in the society we live in so we have to ask ourselves well what sort of world do we want the current world with its war and its crime and its violence and that's it or something so much better a world of everlasting peace and happiness the signs are all around us that the Lord Jesus Christ will return again soon to set up the kingdom of God and a better world is definitely coming but it's up to each of us to decide for us who want to be part of it and if we do then we need to do something about it so if that's you and you want to do something about it or you just want to find out more then please come and talk to us because we'd really love to help thank you